Hey, good evening everybody, and welcome again to Explore MBA. Glad that you're with us here on Tuesday night, uh, and glad to be getting back into this. Um, we've been talking uh, quite a bit about the pathways in between the chairs, and looking forward to continuing that uh, discussion here this evening. It's been quite a day. I've uh, had quite a <laughs> quite a couple of days here. I am I had eight different videos that I had to have finished by Monday for different favors that I uh, had uh, committed to. Forgot to hit my no button that I need to press from time to time. But glad to help out and uh, be an encouragement. But I had uh, camp videos that I was shooting for Hillsboro Family Camp and ended up shooting video and editing until about nine this morning. So took a little nap and uh, that's why I got the monster energy drink with me this evening. Uh, but glad uh, to be able to share tonight and uh, talk a little bit more about this important pathway between chair one and chair two. Uh, last week we talked about this process of moving uh, from chair one to chair two and growing into a uh, follower of Christ. And you can see the, the four chair process that we have there. I'll kind of talk through it again. I'm actually sitting in front of our four chair board and I'll uh, bring that up and I'll uh, here in a second show you. But I, I wanted to show this to you a little bit more clearly in this image. Our idea here is that we're called to follow after Christ, and so there's a process in that. Uh, first, we come and see, um, we get to know what he's about. We follow him. We become active followers and that we create uh, followers our, ourselves as we become fishers of men. And then we grow into a ministry that where we start bearing our own fruit, where we have a very um, personal kind of ministry with our own fingerprint, our own hands. So... That's the process of the four chairs. And um, this is our four chair setup that we have out here at the back of the auditorium. And so thankful to Derek uh, for putting so much effort into this to bring this to the forefront of our hearts and our minds because it really is such an essential part of who we are as a church. Um, and so you'll see over here at the come and see chair, it begins and it says here at the bottom, a recliner is made for taking in experiences, it's an inviting place where you can watch and learn. In chair one, we welcome you to experience the good news of Jesus Christ just as he welcomed people into his life. Here, disciples invite others into our lives and into the church to experience what it means uh, to follow Christ and Lord as Savior. So that's the idea of being in chair one or calling people to chair one. Then chair two behind me, I'll have to get out of the way so that we can read it together. It says, more living is actually done in the kitchen. This is a kitchen chair for chair two. Then in the living room. In the kitchen chair, we discuss the basics, family schedules, daily needs. Chair two in the church is where we grow into the basics of being a disciple, just as Jesus grew his disciples over 18 months of ministry. Consistently join us in worship services as well as study and service opportunities to grow here in chair two. So the question that we've been working on on these uh, uh, in, in these Tuesdays as we're, we've just begun last week and we're going to be moving forward is how do you move between these chairs? And so we have these little markers up here on the wall and we call these the pathways in between the chairs. And so uh, we started on that last week in a get-together here online we called Explore MVA. We talked a little bit about who the church is and why we do what we do. You can go back and check that out if you'd like to see it. But we ended um, talking about the fact that there is a very clear way in which people who are coming to see Jesus, getting an idea of what he's all about, are called to move in a pathway to chair two. And I... I just want to go through that with you this evening and be very clear about that so that uh, there is no question of what it means to move from chair one to chair two. Um, there is a worksheet. There's a PDF sheet on 
profile on Facebook if you'd uh, like to take a look at that. That is available for you and uh, you can always check that out and we're just going to fill in the blanks on that actually. If you, uh, uh, it's actually right listed I think a couple of posts right underneath this one on the uh, studies page. So we're going to head into that right now. I'm getting my technology all up and running here. <laughs> all right. Um, the page one there in Explore MBA, we talked about the church and our aim and our intent and what we are all about. We talked about our core passion to meet people where they are and see move them closer to Jesus, not just about introducing people to Jesus, but actually to go on this journey with them and continue to grow in a life moving closer to him. But this initial step towards Christ is the most fundamentally important because it's the place that we move from curiosity and interest and desire into a relationship. And that comes through the cross of Jesus Christ right here. How do we engage with that? How do we have a true relationship with Jesus? You can see that on page two of your sheet. And we'd love to just walk you through that right now. First of all, you'll see a fill in the blank there. The first thing in this process is that we have to admit, admit that we are sinners. And uh, that can be a very challenging thing in these, uh, th this day and age to come to a place where we can admit our sin. Um, I think one of the reasons is we're just so uh, uneasy about, you know, getting to this place where we actually say that I was wrong right now. I can be mistaken, maybe. Uh, maybe to try to listen to a politician right now say that they were actually wrong or they, you know, they were in the wrong. And people are so defensive online and in our culture everywhere to actually have to get to a place where we realize there is fundamental truth, there is right and there is wrong, and I have committed wrong. But this is the human condition. It's where we all find ourselves. There's no perfect person, not one. And so the first thing that we fundamentally have to do is understand that God is a holy God, and we have to admit that we are not. And so Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 help us to understand the seriousness of this issue. They tell us, for the wages of sin uh, is death in Romans 6.23 and Romans 3.23, a little earlier in the book of Romans, says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not some, it's not a few, it's not the really bad people, it's everybody, all of us, fall short of that holy standard that God has. Um, uh, who God is and, and um, so we have to admit that you, you have sinned against God and that you recognize the penalty for your sin is death and everlasting separation from God wow that is a massive massive um, reality to, to take hold of and grasp and it, it can leave you in a really dark place when you realize that there's really no hope for me except here. And that's where the light of Christ and, and the light of the hope that comes from the cross is, is realized that we truly do have the, the wonderful message of Jesus to share with people. And so what's the second item there? Well, the, the second item, if you're filling in blanks with this, is to decide. Is to decide. To decide to turn from or repent is a churchy word. Uh, from all known rebelliousness against God. And that's something that, again, we call sin. Now, sin is just a rebellion. It's just a, an attitude. It's an action that is taken against the holiness of God. And when you start to examine your life, you'll see a lot of attitudes in your heart that come to the surface. And maybe if you're not very... Um, self-perceptive person, maybe you don't take a lot of time to take a look at your motives. If, it, if you just kind of roll through life, it can be easy to, to miss these things, but if we're honest, if we sit down and really examine ourselves, we'll realize that a lot of things that we do are in opposition, in frustration 
to something greater trying to tell us this is the right path. No way, I'm not going in that direction. I'm not doing that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And we'll even make poor choices that we know are poor choices simply because we don't want to be told what to do. That human condition is something that we have to decide to turn from and to turn towards God and to say, you know what, Lord, I repent of the things in my life that I know are against your will. And there's going to be things in, in your life and in my life that we're going to continually grow and become more and more aware of. We'll, we'll find out down the road, wow, you know what, I, I wasn't even aware of that attitude or, or maybe they, even that thing, specific thing I've been doing for all these years that really wasn't in alignment with God's will, but I'm going to change that now. And so it's a continual lifestyle of repentance. But everything that we know, we just place it on an altar before God in a sense, and we say, I'm laying this down before you, and I'm turning away from it. We decide to turn away. So Acts 3, uh, excuse me, Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will perish. Acts 3, 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and and just washed away completely. Acts 17, 30, now God commands all people everywhere to repent. Why all people? Because all people have sinned and we are called to turn away from it and turn towards God. All right, what's the third uh, approach here that needs to be taken? Well, Number three is that we need to acknowledge. And uh, again, if you're, you're just jumping on with us or joining us, we're filling in some blanks on a PDF on a page that you can download on this studies page, just a couple of posts below this one if you'd like to have your own copy. Uh, it's uh, called Explore MVA, and we're just walking through who we are as a church and the process of moving from a come and see kind of attitude, coming and seeing what Jesus is all about through this pathway to being a follower of Jesus. So we're moving through the pathway right here, and you can fill in the blanks on this PDF. So we've talked about admitting, we talked about deciding, and now we're going to talk about acknowledging something. What are we going to acknowledge? Well, we're going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ willingly took upon himself your sin debt and fully paid its price through his death upon the cross. And that in doing so, he satisfied the justice of God. God is holy, perfect, beyond, set apart is what holiness really means. And he satisfied that set apartness, that holiness of God, which we are not set apart. We are unholy. And in so doing met our need and made us set apart like God, provided a way that we could be set apart in him. We say Jesus Christ is that person, that Messiah that came to allow that to happen. He enables peace with God and he restores a relationship with him. Romans 5 one says, therefore, since you have been justified through faith, we have peace with God, look, through our Lord Jesus Christ. No other way. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, pay careful attention to these passages and the process by which these great things happen. I'll circle back. 1 Peter 2.24-25, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. All right, how did all those things happen? How we've been justified by faith in uh, Romans 5 1? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. God made him, him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. How did that happen? By Jesus becoming sin for us. In him. First uh, Peter 2 He bore our sins in his body so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness and by his wounds we are healed it's all through jesus and now we acknowledge that lord it is only through you that i have this hope and this 
potential freedom that I can have. Not because of anything that I could ever do, but only because of you, Jesus. We acknowledge him. All right. Well, what's next? What's next? By the way, if you have any questions or you'd like to to post here uh, during the live event, or even later, I'll be checking back on this as uh, many people pick it up uh, later down the line. I'd be glad to check in on the comments and uh, address any questions that you have. Um, fourthly, we commit. Fourthly, we commit. Um, what do we commit to? Okay, we've, we've gone through this process where we have admitted that we've sinned. We've decided to turn away from it. We've acknowledged that Jesus is the only way by which we can be saved. But what are we going to now commit ourselves to? Well, we're going to commit our lives to complete devotion to following Jesus Christ as our rescuer, that word savior, and this is the key here, and as our living leader, our Lord, all the days of your life. And these two things are so important to understand. It's one of the most important parts of this pathway for us to, to process and put in because lots of people like the idea of the first part. They, they like the idea of the risen rescuer. I, we, we want a savior. I like the idea of the guy up in the, the helicopter coming down to rescue me when I'm in the floodwaters and zipping me out. But what if that guy also wants me to follow after him and to, to, to follow his teachings and to listen to him for the rest of my life? You see, that's a Lord. That's a living leader. Everybody likes a Savior. A Lord? But we call Jesus Savior and Lord. Lord and Savior. He is both. And so... When we commit our lives to him, we don't just commit to salvation, to his great gift. We commit to his lordship. Whatever he says, whatever you say, God, now my life is in your hands. Father, you have ransomed me. You have sent your son for me. Jesus, you have saved me. I commit my life now to you. Look at these passages, Luke 9, 23 and 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Hey, look here. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. But whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. This is Paul, one of the great followers of Jesus, speaking. He says, what is more, I consider everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may uh, gain Christ. So he's saying, I've put everything behind me in my life. When I gave my life to Jesus, when I committed my life to him, I wasn't just committing to a great deal where I get saved. I was committing my life to his lordship. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be real with you here. Maybe this isn't the greatest sales tactic. <laughs> That's not what this is about. Sometimes the teachings of Jesus are hard, but he's Lord. And here's what the scriptures say over and over. They say that if we'll follow the wisdom of the Lord, that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, that God's ways are always the best ways. In the moment, it's sometimes going to be challenging. There's going to be things that the world say that do not line up with the things that the Bible say. And we're going to have to ask ourselves a question. Who is Lord? The popular opinions of the culture or Jesus? Jesus is Lord. That's what committing our lives to him is about. Finally, number five here, we'll add to the screen, is to be immersed. Now, I mentioned last week that uh, a fellow walked into our church up in Wisconsin one time, and we were talking about, um, I think he was asking about the church, and he said, you know, what are, uh, I got a little monster. Oh. He was, he was asking about the church. He's like, and so the lead minister then, and I wasn't lead minister, I was a worship minister then. Yeah, you know, we were talking about it, talking about different things that we do, outreach programs, and 
things that we have for different people, the kind of, the, the way that we engage in worship on Sundays, stylistically and all those things. He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. What's your thing? What? Well, I don't know. Really. Do you have a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your thing? Uh, I, what do you mean? And he said, every church has a thing. What's your thing? Great question, right? Because there's a lot of churches around. <laughs> there should be a reason for those churches to be here. Otherwise, wouldn't it be kind of sinful for us just not to be one church together? I have all this, these different buildings and different organizations. Um, well, there's some minor differences in the ways that we believe God has gifted this particular family, and there's some very specific strengths that I'm going to talk about in the future as we're talking about who we are and our identity. But theologically, this is one of our things. <laughs> a lot of churches and a lot of the culture has taken this biblical mandate for immersion baptism and made it not an essential part of the process of salvation. And I find it so sad because you'll go to a lot of churches, you hear a lot of great leaders speaking, and they'll share the Bible and the Bible and the Bible. You hear about belief, and you'll hear about, you know, committing. You'll hear about repenting, you know. You'll hear about uh, you know, acknowledging. You'll hear about deciding, all these good things, and they'll back it up with Scripture. And then when you get to the point where you say, and how do you, where, where do you meet God? Where does that happen? How does it happen? Where is the place that I can look back and know that was the moment that I put the ring on the finger and we were married together? And they go, just pray this prayer with me. And I go, what happened? We were in the Bible together. And then why, why are we talking about this sinner's prayer that's not in the Bible anywhere? Or they just say, just believe and you'll be saved. And I go, what do demons believe and shudder? And, and there's some fear in approaching this specific topic out there when there is such a rich amount of scripture that tells us that this is a pinnacle point of the salvation process. I'm going to share with you just the basics of it here. And then uh, we're about five minutes to the end here. So uh, I thought about going into it tonight, but I'm actually going to push it back to next week. And I think what I'll do is I'll record a video for that because I'm going to be out of town next week. But I'm just going to talk about why this is such an important part, essential part of this process, and help you understand why it's our thing, one of our things, okay? But let's just look at the scripture here that we have listed. If you have questions about this, do not hesitate to ask. There are no silly questions. There are no insulting questions about baptism um, because... There's different positions out there, and you might have some questions about it, and I welcome those, and I will be nothing but respectful uh, in response to them. Let's look at some passages of Scripture. On the first day of the church, as the church began, Peter preaches this great gospel message to the Jewish people, and he says, you crucified the Son of God, and he stops speaking, and it says the people were cut to the heart, and... The question is, what did they do? What did they do? Uh, the people were cut to the heart, and, and the question is, what, what did they do? Well, Peter didn't say pray a prayer. He said, they, they said, what do we do? He said, repent, this is Acts 2.38, and be baptized, every one of you. Be immersed. That's what that word means. Baptizo is the Greek word that means immersed. Romans 6.34 says, don't you know that all of you who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. 1 Peter 3.1, and this is a really cool one. Excuse me. Woo, monster. <laughs> it says, And baptism now saves you, not the removal from dirt, uh, of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the reason that one is so cool is it talks about Noah and how he was saved through 
water right before that, which is really interesting because I thought Noah was saved by a boat. But no, he was saved through water. Why? Because if you know the story of Noah and the ark, you know that underneath that water, all of the sin and the ugliness that had taken place in the world was being destroyed. The earth was being renewed. And Noah lands and is refreshed and begins anew. So was he saved by the boat or was he saved by the water? He was saved by the water because the waters destroyed sin. Or or at least it was symbolic of that. It was the place in which God destroyed sin. And so in 1 Peter it says, And baptism, this symbolizes baptism. Not baptism symbolizes the flood, but this, the flood of the earth, symbolizes baptism. Wow. Which now saves you. And it's not because you took a bath and you got the dirt off of you. It is the appeal to God for a good conscience. It's this moment where we go, God, I need you. There's nothing I could do to deserve you. But you put me in this place, God, and you've allowed me through this coming to you, through this process, Father, through this admission, through deciding uh, to repent, through acknowledging you, through committing myself to you. I appeal to you, Father. Change me. And we die, as Romans 6 says, with Jesus. And you know you go under that water and you don't breathe. And then you come up out of it. What's the first thing you do when you come up out of that water? You go, (gasps) and it's the first breath of a new life, forgiven of our sins and filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the simple process by which a come and see person moves through a pathway to being a follower of Jesus. Now there's some stuff there. There's maybe some questions that are going to come up about those five little items. And again, I want to encourage you, you can message me directly. You got my phone number. Feel free to text. Feel free to call. You can message right on uh, the Facebook uh, uh, post here. I'm going, like I said, to talk a little bit next week. I'm just going to spend actually the whole time next week talking about this idea of baptism and why it is a part of the process because it's unique, a little more unique to us. Not There's a lot of churches that understand this from Scripture, but I, I want you to understand why we uh, land on this position of it being an essential part of the process of coming into this beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ. Thanks for spending a little bit of time again with me this evening. I uh, pray that you have just a fantastic uh, and blessed rest of the week. And you know what? I think I might go home and sleep a little bit more. That sounds like a really good idea to me right now. So uh, I'm going to head out of here. Yeah. So take care, everybody. (laughs) We'll see you later.